Good morning and welcome. If you purchased a flag for the Field of Honor in front of the school building, you're asked to please take your flag home with you at this time. If you're unsure of the location of your particular flag, you can go to the school office during the week and they will point you in the right direction. Today's Mass is for the Father's Day Novena. Please stand. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you, so that together we can more worthily celebrate the sacred mysteries we call to mind our sins and entrust ourselves to the mercy and love of God. I confess to Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen.
God who through the grace of adoption chose us to be children of light, grant we pray that we may not be wrapped in the darkness of error, but always be seen to stand in the bright light of truth. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. God did not make death, nor does he rejoice in the destruction of the living. For he fashioned all things that they might have being, and the creatures of the world are wholesome. And there is not a destructive drug among them, nor any domain of the netherworld on earth, for justice is undying. For God formed man to be imperishable. The image of his own nature he made him. But by the envy of the devil, death entered the world, and they who belong to his company experience it. The word of the Lord. from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, as you excel in every respect, in faith, discourse, knowledge, all earnestness, and in the love we have for you, may you excel in this gracious act also. For you know the gracious act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich for your sake, he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Not that others should have relief while you were burdened, but as a matter of equality. Your abundance at the present time should supply their needs, so that their abundance may also supply your needs, that there may be equality. As it is written, whoever had much did not have more, and whoever had little did not have less. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and he stayed close to the sea. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came forward. Sorry, that's the wrong gospel. Wrong gospel, sorry. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and he stayed close to the sea. Still, <laughs> this is not my day. <laughs> it's the first day of the new pastor that I'm here with him, and he's now thinking, he's in the sacristy thinking, I have a complete idiot. Uh, Maybe it is the right gospel. Uh, hold on. <laughs> okay, let's try again. When Jesus crossed again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him and he stayed close to the sea. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came forward Seeing him, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Please come lay your hands on her that she may get well and live. He went off with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed upon him. There was a woman afflicted with hemorrhages for twelve years. She had suffered greatly at the hands of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet she had not help, been helped but only grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She said, if I but touch his clothes, I shall be cured. Immediately her flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Jesus, aware at once that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, who has touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see how the crowd is pressed, pressed upon you, and yet you ask, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. The woman, realizing what had happened to her, approached in fear and trembling. She fell down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. While he was still speaking, people from the synagogue official's house arrived and said, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Disregarding the message that was reported, Jesus said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid. Just have faith. He did not allow anyone to accompany him inside except Peter, James, and John, and the, bro the brother of James. When they arrived at the house of the synagogue official, he caught sight of a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. So he went in and said to them, Why this commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they ridiculed him. Then he put them all out. He took along the child's father and mother and those who were with him and entered the room where the child was. He took the child by the hand and said to her, Talithikum, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. The girl, a child of twelve, arose immediately and walked around. At that they were utterly astounded. He gave strict orders that no one should know this and said that she should be given something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. Your new pastor is going to speak to you this morning. I just ask uh, before he does speak to pray for, we heard two miracles in today's gospel. Pray for a third that my mental uh, acuity gets improved very rapidly so that he doesn't toss me out of here. 
I think we all know how uh, privileged we are to have Monsignor Fink now here in residence uh, at the parish. And I would just like to remind him, Monsignor, for the last two and a half years, all of my mistakes were televised to the entire diocese. So I, I completely understand and sympathize. Well, for those of you who haven't been paying attention, my name is Father McCartney, and I'm the new pastor here at Notre Dame. Uh, I can't tell you how happy I am to be here with you for my first weekend, to have this beautiful assignment. I'm grateful first to Almighty God, second to Our Lady, uh, of course our patroness, and also to Bishop Barris for giving me this assignment. Um, as you know, a few weeks ago, Father Scalaro um, published a little biography of me um, in, the, uh, in the bulletin, so I won't go into many personal details other than to say that I've been a priest for 22 years. I've served in parishes around the diocese. This is the third time that I've been a pastor, and I'm very, very happy um, to receive this assignment, especially because the parish is dedicated to Notre Dame, Our Lady, uh, to whom I've had great devotion for my whole life, uh, but certainly throughout the course of my priesthood. But there's somebody else, of course, that I have to thank, and that is Father Scalaro. Um, you know better than anybody else the extraordinary work that Father Scalaro did in this parish over the three short years that he was here. I've known Father Scalaro since he was a newly ordained priest, we're friends, and I hope you can tell that we're cut from the same cloth, as it were. And um, I can't thank him enough for all the great things that he did, and most especially for the extraordinary way that he shepherded this parish during the course of the pandemic, all the different creative things that he did in order to, to uh, bring the gospel and the presence of Christ to the people when they were not able to come to mass. And so I'll always be indebted to him, and I want all of you to know that all of the things that he began, we intend to continue, and even together we'll build on them. Um, for those who may be wondering, certainly the capital campaign goes forward. We still have the plans to renovate the convent into the parish center and hopefully even the sanctuary later on. And so all of those things will continue. I also have to say that I'm very uh, grateful for the presence of the Ciro Malabar community, Father Joseph, and all the people uh, who worship here as their home at Notre Dame. Um, I actually con celebrated my first Ciro Malabar Mass just the other night, Thursday night, and it was fascinating. It was the first one that I had ever seen, um, and to meet the people there. One other thing, I'm so grateful that we have a parish school. You know, in my other parishes, I've served in parishes that had regional schools, and I've been in two parishes that had a parish school. And I think we all know when the parish has a school, the parish is different. There's a life to the parish that you don't see sometimes in other places. It's almost like when there are children in the home, the home is different. And so I've already been to meet all the teachers before they went on break. I've met all the children in the school, and I look forward to being very active and present in um, Notre Dame School uh, when they resume in September. Now, one of the things that I thought I would begin by preaching to you, because the best way for you to get to know me is through preaching. And as Monsignor said, we had an extraordinary gospel here with these two miracles, one sort of inside the other. But these miracles are very spiritually profitable for us. So the first one begins when Jesus arrives at the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he's met by this man named Jairus. And Jairus was called the leader or the ruler of the local synagogue. Now, that doesn't mean that he was the rabbi. It probably means that he was one of these men who was wealthy, who was a prominent citizen in the community. Maybe he had given his home or a portion of it, if it was large, over to be the synagogue. Maybe he had built the synagogue or funded it for the people. So he would have been among the most respected members of this community. And this man immediately prostrates himself at Jesus' feet, and he begs. I don't think this man did this very often in his life. 
but he did it this time because his daughter was so ill she was at the point of death. And as everyone understands, of course, when you want something so much, you're willing to do practically anything. And so this man begs Jesus to come and to heal his daughter. But you know, there's another cost to what Jairus did. Because many of the Jewish leaders, people that he would have associated with, were already opposed to Jesus. The last time in the Gospel of St. Mark that Jesus went to a synagogue, they started plotting to kill him after he left. And so that shows you that this really might have come at a great personal cost to this man but he didn't care because he loved his daughter so much. So Jesus and Jairus and the rest begin. And on the way, they encounter this woman. Now the woman, we're told by St. Mark, has a continuous flow of blood. Now this would be a terrible affliction for anybody, but for a Jewish person in the first century, it was devastating because this made this woman, through no fault of her own, ritually unclean, which meant that she would not be able to go into the synagogue, she would not be able to go certainly into the temple in Jerusalem, she would be excluded, and she, not only that, but she couldn't have any contact with other people. She probably would lose contact with her family because anybody who came in contact with her or touched her would be unclean themselves. And so this woman, because no fault of her own, but through her illness, had become like an outcast in society. And so she gets this idea. She knows that Jesus is passing by, and she says, I can't go up to him. You see, she, this is the reason she couldn't do what Jairus did. She couldn't approach Jesus through a crowd of people and talk to him because she wasn't supposed to. So she thinks, if I can only go up and touch the tassel of his cloak, I know, I absolutely know that I will be healed. And so this is what she does. She might have had to conceal her identity when she made her way through the crowd because it would require that she touch people and bump into people. And she's able to touch the tassel and immediately she feels that she's healed. Now, at this point, Jesus stops, and he feels that the power, that a miracle has occurred, that power has gone out from him, and he stops and he says, who touched me? And at this point, it becomes a little comical. You know, most people don't find humor in the Gospels, but it's there. You just have to look a little carefully. And I will give you a hint. The apostles are always the comic relief in the Gospels whenever they occur. And the apostles say, who touched you? A thousand people have touched all of us in the last 15 minutes, Lord. Their crowds are pressing in. They're trying to get to Jesus. The apostles must have been black and blue from all of the people and the crowds. And they can't imagine what Jesus is talking about. But there's one person who does know what he's talking about, the woman. She knows, he knows what she did. And so she does the right thing. She comes to him, and now she does what Jairus did. She prostrates herself at his feet, this great act of humility, and she tells him everything. And of course, his response is not to be angry, but it's to say, daughter, your faith has healed you. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't say, I've healed you. He says, your faith has healed you. It's like this woman stole a miracle from Jesus because her faith was so profound, was so strong, was so tremendous. He says, go and be cured of your affliction. And then St. Mark resumes the original story. But now just for a moment, think that you're Jairus. Here, you're not even sure you can get to see Jesus. You do. You're not sure he'll come. He's coming. And now before he can get to your daughter, you see him perform, perform a miracle that's amazing. And so Jairus must have been so heartened by that. 
and then from the heights of hope to the depths of despair, people come and say, your daughter's dead. It seems a very cruel way to tell a father that this tragedy has happened. And I've often wondered if maybe those people who came in that delegation were opposed to Jesus, and they didn't want Jesus coming and they didn't want him to try to do anything for the girl because people would believe in him. And so they say, don't trouble the teacher any longer. There's no point, it's impossible. And this is the point where Jesus turns to Jairus and says what could be one of the most important sentences in all of sacred scripture. Don't be afraid, just have faith. My brothers and sisters, that phrase could well be inscribed on the lintel of every door of every member of this parish. Don't be afraid, just have faith. And so they go along. But I would find it hard to believe that Jairus really did think that Jesus was going to be able to. It's one thing to cure a person from illness, but certainly no one could ever raise anyone from the dead. And so they get to the house, and of course there's weeping and wailing and people carrying on. Certainly it's a tragedy. But Jesus says, why are you upset? The little girl is not dead, she's only asleep. And in one of the worst lines in all of sacred scripture, they ridiculed him. God has come to that house, that family, that neighborhood, and they mock him. They ridicule him. People still ridicule God to this day. And Jesus puts them all out. He will not work a miracle in the presence of such unbelief. And that's a very important lesson for all of us. So often we don't realize that miracles are not happening to the degree that they should in the world today because of the lack of belief that's throughout the world. And the same in our communities and the same in our families. When we don't believe, we tie God's hands. God doesn't impose himself on us. He offers us an invitation. He waits for, to be invited. Bring me into your life, bring me into your home, and I will do these things. And so, he puts these unbelievers out, and he takes Peter, James, and John with him. Now that's interesting, because Peter, James, and John were the inner core of the apostles. They were brought with Jesus to all of the most important moments of his public ministry. That means that this, the raising of the daughter of Jairus is one of the most important moments in his ministry. And Jesus goes up to the little girl and he touches her hand. And St. Mark records the original words in Aramaic that Jesus actually said. Talitha kum, little girl, I say to you, arise. And the little girl sat up immediately. The woman with the hemorrhage reached out her hand and touched Jesus. Jesus reaches out with his hand and touches the girl's hand. The girl was 12, the woman had suffered for 12 years. It's all coming together. And the little girl gets up and Jesus says something that's very fascinating. He says, give her something to eat. Now, you know, when we come through an illness, the first thing you want to do is give the sick person some food to start to nourish them and restore them to health. But there's another way of looking at this. It's an image of the Holy Eucharist. Jesus comes into our lives when we're dead in sin. And through the sacrament of baptism, he gives us life. He restores us to life. Or if we're older, through, and our, through our own sins, he restores us through the sacrament of confession. 
And then once we're restored to life by Jesus, he says, come and I will feed you. You need nourishment. I will give you my body, blood, soul, and divinity to eat. My brothers and sisters, these two stories and these two people, Jairus and the woman with the hemorrhage, teach us a very, very profound lesson. Jesus wants us to invite him into our lives. That's the most important thing. And like Jairus and the woman, we have to approach Jesus first with humility. They both did that. And then we have to truly have faith and believe in him. Everything that he teaches, not just the easy things, but everything. And just think about this. In a few moments, through the hands and the mouth of Monsignor Fink, Jesus is going to become sacramentally present here on our altar. He's going to come into our parish and our community, just like he did to those places 2,000 years ago. And there's going to be a crowd of people. Remember, a 1,000 people touched Jesus that day but only one person got a miracle because only one person touched him in faith. When you start coming up to receive Jesus in Holy Communion, think that you are a member of that crowd and say to yourself, I have to pay attention to what I'm doing. I have to recognize that in a few moments, I'm going to get to touch the Lord Jesus and he's going to touch me. My brothers and sisters, Remember the lesson of this gospel. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. give that an A+. Plus. <laughs> it's pretty darn good. Our profession of faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men, for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit, who was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead life of the world to come. Amen. With faith and confidence in God's never-failing providential care for us, we turn to him now in prayer, asking his blessing on us and on all his beloved children throughout the world. Our response today is, Lord, hear our prayer, that the church and her leaders will continue to be a sign of faith to all people in a world faced with sadness and strife. We pray to the Lord that as nations observe Independence Day later this week, we may all give thanks for our freedom and use it in the service of life and of God, we pray to the Lord. That citizens may recommit themselves to exercising their right and duty to vote in every election, we pray to the Lord. 
that God who did not make death and who is the source of all life may bring an end to the abortion and all other forms of violence of, in our world. We pray to the Lord that our community of faith may be a living example of the mystery of God's presence among us by our love for each other. We pray to the Lord. For all those who are called to the priesthood, religious life, and diaconate, that they may hear and answer God's call with the support of family and friends, we pray to the Lord. For all those who are sick, especially Joseph D. Pascal, Kevin Dudich, Melanie Tufano, that they may experience God's healing and comfort. And for all who have died, especially Anthony Leva, Gary W. Zimmerman, and, and all those that they may be raised to new life, including Jared Guitarez, we pray to the Lord. And for all today for whom this Mass is being offered for the intentions in our prayer request booklet and for all the intentions we hold in the silence of our hearts. We pray to the Lord. Good and gracious God, Father of mercy, show us your kindness. Deepen our faith and our share in the risen life of your Son, Jesus. We ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. brothers and sisters in Christ, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. O God, who graciously accomplished the effects of your mysteries, grant, we pray, that the deeds by which we serve you may be worthy of these sacred gifts, through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For out of compassion for the waywardness that is ours, he humbled himself and was born of the Virgin. By the passion of the cross, he freed us from unending death, by rising from the dead, he gave us eternal life. 
and so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, Jesus took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, Jesus took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, Father, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. mystery of faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, John, our Bishop, all the clergy, and all your people, especially the family you've gathered here today. Remember our brothers and sisters who've fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles, and all the saints who've pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. United as one in the Lord Jesus, we pray now in the words he gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. May this divine sacrifice we have offered and received fill us with life, O Lord, we pray, so that bound you in lasting charity, we may bear fruit that lasts forever through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. May God's angels watch over you and all his saints pray for you and everyone live in peace with you. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And go in peace. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Amen.